Hello everyone and welcome to the Be Ready to the, uh, for the World Conference. I'm Tom from Cambridge University Press and I'll be hosting your webinar this afternoon. Um, I'm really delighted to be joined by Ems Lord, who's going to take you through this session on hands-on mathematics. Uh, Ems is the director of Enrich. She's a member of the Joint Mathematical Council and is a research fellow at Clare Hall at the University of Cambridge. And Cambridge University Press has worked uh, really frequently with Enrich and it's always a, a great pleasure to listen to Ems speak. Before we start, I just wanted to go through a few points with you. Uh, you may have noticed that your microphones are muted. They're going to stay on mute as we go through the session, uh, and that's to avoid any background noise. Uh, Ems and I are also both hosting this webinar from our homes, so if there are any issues with our internet connections, please do bear with us. Um, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, so please do feel free to post any questions that you'd like in the question and answer box as we go along. Uh, you can also use the chat box for any general comments, uh, but please don't post direct questions for Ems in the, in the chat box as they will, might get lost. If you're having any technical difficulties with sound or with video, please do let us know in the chat. Uh, we'll do our best to resolve them. Um, um, but the session is being recorded and we will send a link to the playlist afterwards, so don't worry if you miss anything. Uh, if you are unable to see the question and answer or the chat icons, do hover your mouse uh, at the bottom or the top of the screen and hopefully they will appear. And so now it just uh, gives me great pleasure to, to hand over to Ems. Thank you very much, Tom. And hello, everyone. Um, just having a look through the chat there. And wow, we really do have an international audience here. So uh, thank you for putting in there where you're from and welcome to the session. Really excited to be here this afternoon um to share our hands-on approach to learning mathematics um and to becoming a mathematician um i think during the discussion we'll see that two things are not necessarily the same the learning mathematics but becoming a mathematician as well and we'll look at some of the research behind it uh, explore some of the activities together and just hopefully have a, a great half hour thinking mathematically and then tom and i uh, will have a look at some of the questions that come in so thank you again for your time this afternoon um, or whichever part of the day uh, you're joining us. So um, Enrich, we've been working with Tom and the team uh, for an extended period. We've been looking at the um, Cambridge primary and secondary maths books, and we've been very busy beavering away, uh, writing projects to complement the content of the chapters. Um, it's been a really exciting time to work together. And in the process of doing that, we've sat back, we've had a really good look at the thinking behind our design, um, the research behind it, and how that leads to the typical sort of enriched activities that you'll see in the books and we'll be exploring this afternoon. So I thought it'd be really great to have a look at that and talk about the low threshold, high ceiling approach that we talk about, the exploratory nature of our work. I can do all the theory, but I thought it might be fun first. Let's do some maths. And then when we're talking about it, we can reflect back on an activity we've done. Hopefully that sounds like a really nice approach to be doing. So if I have a go at sharing my screen, and as Tom said, we're all working from home. So fingers crossed, everything works. And what I'm hoping now is that you can see the Enrich homepage. And I'm going to go along here to one of my favorite activities. Um, this is missing multipliers, and this activity, I think, is a really good example for our low threshold, high ceiling approach um, and the exploratory hands on nature of doing mathematics. If you're familiar with the work of Polya, Polya often talks about the different math strategies you can use, and one of them is working backwards. And I think it's one I probably used when I was doing my school maths and I had a textbook with the answers in. I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but if I got stuck, sometimes I go to the back, look at the answer, go to the front, look at the question and try to find a way in between. So I was working backwards. Sometimes it worked, sometimes perhaps not so successful. But this is a lovely example of using that approach of working backwards. So let's have a think. So what we need to do is if we click on a square, so let me click on this one here. You see a number's come up. So we've got 25. Now, the challenge is to think of which number would go up here and which number would go there to give me 25. Now, if I want, I can keep clicking 
on these squares, we're getting more and more clues. But you may be very eagle eyed and realised here, there's a number of reveals left. So it's not going to let me click on all of them. So what I need to do really is choose a square to click on next. Unless anybody's got any suggestions on what might go here and what might go here. So if you want to take a moment and pop something in the chat um, and then we'll have a look at your answers and try one of them in there. Ah, yes. <laughs> now these numbers are signed randomly. And as you've noticed, if I click on here and just put the five there and I click there, I put the five. Yeah, we got a prime number to begin with, didn't we? OK, so we've got that one sorted. But unfortunately, at the moment, I can't fill in these others. OK, so we need to choose another square to click on. So if we call these A, B, C and D and one, two, three, four. So that was A3 that we've done. Would you like to click in the chat the next one that you would like? Um, thinking strategically, so we try not to use too many of our reveals. So what do you reckon? Which one should we click on next? OK, Mel's suggesting B3. So if I go A, B and then go up to here. Oh, yeah, I can see some of the thinking that's going on there. So let's click. Ah, OK, so this time I've got 35 and I already know something about this row. So. As a uh, Sonna saying in the chat and Maloney, we've got a seven that will go there. Thank you, guys. OK, so as you can see, as I go along, I can start to populate all the cells. So I'm working backwards. I've got the answers. I'm trying to think what the factors were. Low threshold, high ceiling. Where does that side come into it? Well, what I'm hoping you found with activity, because you've not seen it before, probably, um, it's something you can get started on very quickly. Once somebody clicks on a square, they can probably start thinking about some of the numbers that we'd use to get there. So low threshold, we hope students are knowing and valuing knowing then their multiples. Where does the high ceiling come in? Well, we'd suggest that the high ceiling comes in because trying to think strategically. Where's the best place to reveal the numbers? Where wouldn't you want to click? to reveal a number. That can also be a really nice strategy. So we're starting to think about some higher order skills. And we've got these reveals there as the extra challenge. So low threshold, do this with a whole class or get them playing it in pairs. But there's a high ceiling in there to get them thinking mathematically. There's also up here the settings tab so you can be a little bit creative and they alter the number of reveals as well. Because you may have students who you do want to have unlimited amounts of attempts. So where does this idea come from? If we're doing low threshold, high ceiling, exploratory approach where we want the children to be enjoying an adventure, doing the mathematics to engage them, where does that come from? Well, the low threshold, high ceiling comes from the world of computer programming. And I'm sure many of you are familiar or have heard of work of Logo, maybe saw Logo Turtles in school when you were younger. That comes to the research of Seymour Pape and at one time of Cambridge doing research at university, latterly at MIT. And he came up with the idea of wanting to have a programming language that adults could use to do complex work, but could also be used by children. Now, that's a big ask. But that was his design principle when he came up with Logo. He wanted a programming language that a child could use an adult could use and it was phenomenally successful. So it enriched when we design activities such as when we were working with Tom and his colleagues, we were looking for activities which had a low threshold so you could safely use them whole class but that high ceiling so you're encouraging mathematical thinking, strategic thinking, 
it's beginning to work efficiently and all those qualities that you look for in a mathematician. So I think an activity like missing multipliers is a really nice example of what we've got on the site. But what else is there? Because not everything that we look at is going to be using number. So if I just search for a different activity here. Let's try something to do with shape. Can we do low threshold, high ceiling with shape? Well, I'd say yes, we can. So polyplug rectangles. We've got a little activity here. And what you've got here, it's a grid again. But the grid uses eight plugs. So what we've basically hidden is some rectangles here. And because it uses eight plugs, it's a rectangle that uses eight circles. So I remember when I was younger, I used to play pencil and paper battleships. And what's lovely with this sort of activity, again, it's based on the research, uh, the Noons research, which looked at mathematics from key stage two to key stage three, which is some of the ages we're looking at today. And we know to make a successful transition into secondary maths, we need students who know their maths facts, but can also visualize really well. And being able to visualize and hold ideas in your head is exactly what this is about. So low threshold, hopefully we can all think of a circle to click on. High ceiling, again, you can work on the number of guesses that you need. So if I put the chat up on here, and if we do a similar system that we did before, so if I call these A, B, C, D, E, and number one upwards, I wonder if we're going to try and guess the rectangle and locate it in the minimum number of goes, and we know it uses eight circles, where's the best place you think to start? Okay, so I think um, we've got a suggestion there to maybe the three by three. So I think the suggestion is to try there. Okay, that's interesting because that's in the middle. That'd be interesting to think about the thinking there. So let's click on it. Ah, okay, so it's not there, but we know it uses eight circles and we know it's a rectangle. So we've got some suggestions to go above that. Let's try above it. <sighs> Missed it again, but hopefully we're getting closer. Try an improvement. Um, D2, let's try here. Thanks, Russell. Ah, so with uh, some really good teamwork going on there, we worked out where it isn't, and we now know where one of the circles is, and it uses eight circles altogether. Um, Alan's suggesting from the core, let's try that. Ah. Now I'm wondering, do we think we know where this rectangle is or should we have another guess? I'm wondering if it's eight plugs, I think I might know where it is, okay? We're thinking it's a four by two, I'm wondering about this here, yeah? If you know where it is, click the ready, okay? Are you certain? Yeah. So what I can do now is I can actually put on where I think the rectangle is. So thank you for your help with that. I think it's there. And two more. Okay, let's see if we're right. Click on the ready. <sighs> One last try. So close, so close. Okay, interesting. I wonder where it could be from there. So, try the D1. Ah, so there is another orientation. Try the D3, yes. Aha. Now, I could click them all, but let's see if we're ready this time. Certain, yes. Let's try it out. Let's see what happens. So click on these. Here we go. Fingers crossed. Yes, brilliant. Absolutely right. Okay, well, that's a nice feeling. So 
low threshold, high ceiling. Is this an activity we could give to a class, let them explore in pairs and they can get on with it and they can get some mathematics out of it? I'd suggest yes, they can. Is there a high ceiling? I would suggest there's a very high ceiling on this. For starters, our rectangles were either horizontal or vertical. Um, you can play this using diagonals as well. And if you're familiar with some of the test questions that we have for the end of primary in England, that can be a very useful thing to be practicing. You can alter the size of the rectangles as well. So again, you've got this settings button. So if we click on here, we see you can actually alter the sizes, the dimensions of your rectangles. So we've got low threshold, high ceiling. So we're using that work from Seema Pape to deliver the mathematics, but also taking this, what we call exploratory hands-on approach to learning. And that's really important to the team at Enrich. When you're working in schools, quite often a familiar approach is as teachers, we deliver our input and students listen, they may join in, they then go off and practice. What we're looking to do, and this is based on the work of Ken Ruffin over at the Faculty of Education at Cambridge, is we're looking to take a different approach where the children start doing mathematics as soon as possible themselves. So right from the very beginning, they can get on with these activities. And equals is exploratory approach, hands-on approach we like to think of it, where the children are doing the mathematics. This is the sort of approach that Jo Bowler was talking about in some of her work. And she has that phenomenally successful website where she's looking at her approach to mathematics. And there's been a lot of academic research into the impact of that approach on the children's learning, but also their attitudes to mathematics going forward. And I think that's really important. And that's why at the beginning, I talked about learning mathematics and the difference with becoming a mathematician and I think somebody can learn mathematics, be academically very successful as a mathematician, but, and I think this is a very important but, not appreciate the, not appreciate the subject, not appreciate why some of us want to study it, and not understand how exciting and how beautiful a subject it can be. And if those students leave with that and maybe become negative about mathematics, it can be passed down through the generations, we know that, but it also harms our ability to do future research, make future discoveries. I mean, mathematics is so important at the moment. Every time you switch on the news, people talk about mathematical modeling and we need more people to be going into mathematics, be enthused by it and seeing its potential. So, when we're doing work at Enrich and we're looking at the possibilities of mathematics, we're trying to do what we would call a five strand approach. So what you can see here on your screen is a piece of rope. You can see these five strands. This is where we go from learning mathematics to becoming a mathematician. Really important distinction. So if we think about the curriculum, let me think about the curriculum in England. It's the one I'm most familiar with. I do work with other jurisdictions as well. But the one in England has two very key aims. It's to develop procedural fluency and conceptual understanding. Both very important. As you can see here, they're both in this model, procedural fluency, conceptual understanding. And if the students get those, and they're familiar with them and they practice, they can have success in their primary and secondary exams. But you can still have a child who can do long division, but who doesn't understand what a fantastic subject maths is, may not enjoy doing mathematics, may choose not to study it, even if they're good at it, and then those negative views can be passed down. And that's such a shame. And for me as a mathematician, I want to shout out about what a great subject it is I'm involved with. I want to shout about the projects we've been doing um, with CUP. And I want to encourage future mathematicians 
So if I only focus our work on conceptual understanding and procedural fluency, we're missing a trick. We're missing the chance to bring forward young mathematicians. So what else is needed to do that? The reasoning aspect, going beyond a description. Well, first I clicked on that square and then I clicked on another square to find the rectangle. What you were doing when I looked at the chat, there was reasoning going on. You were th weren't just choosing them out of thin air. There was a lot of thought going into that. And I think that's one thing that I've always valued at Enrich, the opportunity for the children to share their ideas by submitting solutions. I think that's a really important aspect of the mathematics, valuing the reasoning, not just the answer. The journey is so important. Comparing approaches, learning different approaches, because if a child only knows one approach, what happens when they get stuck? We tell them, try, try, try again. But if your approach isn't working, no matter how hard you try, it's good to have other ways in. And this is where we head into strategic competence, problem solving. What maths is all about, it's about solving problems. And when we're working mathematically, what we're trying to do is choose the most appropriate pieces of mathematics to solve the problem. Or if you're a researcher, maybe working on new areas of mathematics to solve problems. But strategic competence goes beyond that. It's also about problem posing, being curious, having problems where you can go on that settings tab like we did and said, I wonder what would happen if I change the size of the rectangle. Can I guess it as quickly? How many guesses would it take to guess those multipliers if I had a six by six or an eight by eight? Because we've put those on there as well. So having that curiosity is really important. It's like wanting to write a story or draw a picture. Being curious with maths is so important. So that's four of the strands to make this strong rope. And here's the fifth one, productive disposition. The children wanting to do the maths. And there was one example I came across when I was researching with a school and we looked at an activity and the child had said to me, this is just like fishing. I went, really? This activity had nothing to do with fishing from what I could tell. But they said, no. They said, I tried it and I wanted to get it right and I didn't get it right first time. And she said she was hooked and she kept trying it. She got it right. She went off and she then shared it with older siblings, parents, older family members, because she knew how to do something that they didn't. And that was very special to her. So she talked about being hooked on the maths. So we look for engaging activities. And that has been such fun working with Tom's team, looking at the maths in the books and thinking, right, what sort of engaging activities will complement what's in these texts? The children wanting to do math is so important and having that positive disposition that they want to do it. So that's what we look for when we're designing. Low threshold, high ceiling, satisfying those five strands and a hands-on approach. So to finish, I know my time is running out, but we do have time to look at Got It because I love Got It. It's such a lovely low threshold, high ceiling activity. So here we go. Now, when I was younger, I played this pencil and paper, so it may seem very familiar to you. But I think this encapsulates everything that we've been talking about in this session. Low threshold, high ceiling, exploratory in the five strands. Get started really quickly. We've got a target of 23. And we can enter one of these four numbers. And we're trying to get to that total. And we're going to play the computer and it's letting us go first. So what we can do is we can choose one of those numbers and we can click on it. I'm wondering which number would you like? So Pranit suggested we click on two. Um, is that the majority view? Shall we go for that? Or would you like a different number? Let's have a think. Okay, Mel's thinking four. So we've got an equal tie here. 
Let's see if the next one that goes in is the same or different. Oh, we've got a one. So we've got the huge spread here of which number to go for. Okay, we've got a few fours. So to be fair, let's try with four. So if I click on that, there we go. The computer's taking a turn. Oh, what a compliment. The computer has chosen the same number as you. So we've reached eight. It's now our turn again. So if you could kindly choose the number you would like this time. Our target is 23. We'll try and be first there. OK, Alan suggested three. We've got some threes. Isabel suggested a four. Laura's a two. I think there's mostly threes. Let's see what happens. So we're on 11. And the computer's added. And now we're on 13. OK, so starting at 13, which number would you like to have now? OK, so. Oh, Quite a few people suggesting four, and there's a few threes. Let's go for four. It seemed to be the most popular one initially. There's four. So we're on 18. OK. We're on 18. Our turn. What would you like this time? OK. Crystal, Monali, all threes. Let's go for three. Computer turn. OK, I love the comment there in the chat. Oh, wow, my students would love this. I love playing this. I think this is great. I love the fact it's low threshold. I play this with students. I play this uh, when I go into schools at governor's meetings, when I'm explaining the approach that we take. There is a high ceiling to this. I'm sure many of you were trying to think, and you didn't have long, I apologise, trying to think about which numbers were the most pivotal, uh, most important for you to make that step up to 23, where it became a key moment. Now, remember I mentioned about being curious and wanting to tweak things. Well, again, your students can tweak this. So they think they've got it and they want to go and try it maybe with other people. Why not click on the settings, choose the type of game, We've got different types. They might want to play a partner rather than the computer. They might want to alter who goes first and second, change the target number and the numbers they can add. There is a huge amount of things that your students can go on and explore. Now, I'm just here just giving a flavour of some of the things that we've done. This is one of the activities that students kept coming back to and wanting to share with different family members and friends. I even got a sketch of a young student, year seven, um, so 12 years old, and it was part of a research project. We did before and after sketches to do this homework. And the before sketch, this student was sat in their room on their mobile phone doing their online maths homework by themselves, no conversation going on, there's no interaction with family members. Home it was something they went upstairs to do by themselves. We encourage them to look at enrich activities, one a week. And then at the end of the project, I went back and said, come on, can you draw me a picture of your homework when you were doing an enrich activity? Let me see what you were doing. And my heart sang when I saw some of the photo, uh, uh, drawings that they did. The children, and this one in particular, he was no longer in his bedroom doing his homework. He was playing Got It, and he'd gone down into the lounge. He'd got his phone plugged into the telly, and him and his friends were sat on the settee doing maths together. Big smiles on their faces, having fun. It was engaging. They were exploring. It was hands-on. Low threshold, high ceiling. It was a group of friends together all working mathematically. So they're learning maths, but they're also becoming mathematicians. And that's what we're about. And that's why I was so delighted when I got the call from Tom saying, could we team up and work together on this series of books? So thank you very much for your time so far this afternoon. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the chat as we go along. I also aware that Tom's keeping an eye on the Q&A too. So Tom, if I stop sharing here and then perhaps we can look at some of these questions that are coming in. 
Perfect. Um, thank you very, very much for that. That was that was a really great session. And personally, for me, got it in various forms. It's been a the staple of car journeys for many years with my own children. And um, so the, some questions have been coming into the question and answer box. And I think the, the first one that I'd like to point out is actually it's a really interesting question from Peter Chong. And, um, and he asks, how do you come up with the ideas for designing low threshold and high ceiling tasks? Where do you start? Wow, what a fantastic question. Um, where we start from, um, and I think this is crucial, is the team are all very experienced classroom teachers who know the curriculum and know the progression and we work together as a team. So we think about a curriculum area where we need resources. So when we're working on the books, we were given a list of topics to be covering and it was about sitting down as a team and sharing ideas together and then working backwards. So it might be quite high level activity, putting the scaffolding in and then going away and trying it between ourselves, trying things with family members and refining them. So it was very much a team effort and an iterative effort. And if you put the effort in, then something like got it comes out at the other end. But it, it's time consuming. I, I won't say it's not, but it's also it's, it's incredible fun. I'm not going to hide that either. We have fun doing these. Thank you, Peter. And um, a, another question that's come in, and it's it's something that I think that we all grapple with, uh, particularly over the past 12 months, which is about teaching and checking geometrical constructions through through this kind of approach, uh, particularly on an online uh, remote learning environment where it's really difficult to do. I was wondering sort of uh, what, what sort of uh, enrich activities could you recommend in, in the geometry space? Yeah, geometry can be one of the challenges. Um, but it comes back to working flexibly and sometimes when students are explaining their reasoning and that gives us a really good way of going about some of these things because having the steps and reorganising them can be really useful so they can see the step by step approach. But what we also do is when we put an activity up, we quite often put up hints. We've been told by students very clearly that they want to get straight on with things. They don't want too much explanation. So we put an activity up so they can get started, but then we put hints underneath. So if it's something geometrical that they're working on and they want to weigh in, they can click on the hint if they want it. If they don't want a spoiler, they can ignore it or go back to it later if they get stuck. And we find that works well. And the other thing that works well is we have a solutions tab and there's solutions sent in by children. That's really important. And so what happens there is if they get stuck, them or their teacher can go on it. And I know teachers quite often take a question or take an answer and hide most of it. So it's just the beginning of a solution from another child so that they get the hint without it being spoiled. But again, if a child's always trying one way and actually it's just not working for them in geometry, they need to think differently. What can work well is sharing another child's solution saying, look, just follow this through. And then once you're happy with it, it's like taking the stabilizers off a bike. Once you're happy, try it yourself. So what we try and do is put up multiple solutions and multiple hints. So it appeals to the different ways that they learn and they think. But again, cracking question. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. So I'm looking at the, the, the questions in the chat and um, I think one of the ones I'd like to ask, it's, it's something you started off in your talk about, which is uh, how do we get students excited about maths lessons? And then how do we improve mental math skills in children? And I wonder if you could talk a little bit around how, how you see Enrich being able to stimulate kids' ideas. I think the way, the way forwards is first off having the enthusiasm. And one of the teachers I spoke to recently when I was doing some research on another project was saying the most important thing for them was doing the activity first themselves. Because if they understood it and knew the potential, then they could really go places with their class, but they had to try it themselves and understand it, work out the low threshold for their class and where the high ceiling took them. So part of it is being really familiar with the maths yourselves and being excited. And I get excited if it's something that engages my interest and something that I don't want to put down that I'd want to carry on when I go and have a coffee break 
or I want to talk about at home. So it can be linking to real life. It doesn't always have to be. It has to be a puzzle. And Kuoko and colleagues wrote a paper called Habits of Mind. And I think the sorts of attitudes in Habits of Mind, the quality, are what we're looking for when we plan resources and we teach. So Kuoko talks about encouraging the children to tinker, which I think we do with the settings. Encouraging them to investigate, which I think we do with the way we word things and the key questions we put on our activities. And best of all, I absolutely love this comment, encouraging them to be pattern sniffers. So when you're out and about and you see things on signs or you look at numbers in newspapers, what's special about it? What do you notice? Have you seen that somewhere before? And that aspect, I think, is absolutely fascinating. So I think sharing enthusiasm and to do that, we have to be confident and to get the confidence. It's about setting aside the time to do maths. I've spoke with many schools where staff meetings start by doing some mathematics. And I think that's a lovely way in. There's only so many hours in the day and a really good time saving idea, I'd suggest, is every half term we upload new resources to enrich on a theme. But what our coordinators do, primary and secondary, Liz and Charlie, they do a free webinar every half term where they walk you through them, explore them together and ideas, which saves time, but it gives you a chance to explore the activities before you do them. And then hopefully your students will send in their ideas and then we'll publish them on the rich site and have a really enthused generation of students going forward. So thank you very much for that question. Yeah, it's, um, I, I really, I really like the idea of encouraging students to sort of to tinker with things, to just play around and see if they change something, what happens. So um, it's a, it's yeah, it's a really great way to get get students engaged. Um, for anyone in the audience that's listening, um, I, a, a simple Google search or web browser search for Enrich will find you with the website. Um, I think we can probably post the website address in the chat as well for you. Um, another question that um, has come in in the chat, but I also wanted to sort of ask uh, uh, for my own uh, question as well, is, um, is around how we can, how teachers can run these kind of hands-on activities uh, during remote conditions. So one of the questions in the chat was about uh, running these activities without the use of gadgets in a physical classroom. And I think Enrich provides a perfect opportunity for all sorts of different options. Oh, what a great question. Yeah, this was the problem we had late February when it became very clear that everything was going to shut down, maybe for a significant time. And how did we continue supporting schools? And I, I guess it was the same for you, Tom, with your colleagues, how you go on supporting, because we're very aware that not everybody can get online and certainly not for extended periods. So what we did is for a limited time, we stopped doing our half termly updates. And instead, we launched something called Maths at Home. And it was ready before the school shut down in the UK. It went live three or four days beforehand. And with Maths at Home, we organised five different areas. And if you look at Enrich, you go on the home page, there's a yellow horizontal bar, it's still there, Maths at Home. We did it for every key stage, so every two or three year groups, and they're all the same plans. So there are activities on there that are pencil and paper that schools could set or parents can look at some time and the children can get on with them. There is an area for interactivities for when they've got the time and the access to do so. We put another area, maths at home, where it's using equipment that you would find at home. So it could be using buttons, it could be using beans, it could be using shoes, stuff that wouldn't be in the classroom. And we've also put activities which take longer because one thing we've learned in lockdown is it's really hard to sit there for a long time and concentrate at home. It's much better to be able to dip in and out maybe on the same day and maybe on other days. So we've done maths to take your time over. And we've put these variety, there's five different categories. There's activities on there, we've grouped for schools, which we printed out. But teachers or parents can print them out and use them later. So it might be there's one computer at home, which is great, but everybody needs to do it, work and study. So things could be printed off and used later or schools can send home packs. And for each year group, we've got those five categories. We've populated them with resources. And as a result, first week of closures, 
over a million views on the website. It's been huge. It's been incredibly hard work, but I'm lucky I'm part of a fantastic team and that was ready before the schools closed in the UK and we've kept it up there ever since. You mentioned a couple of times uh, within within that answer about uh, parents and uh, so as yeah, I think um, sort of parental involvement, um, it's obviously a really big part of children's development. How, how, how can the teachers use uh, the Enrich activities, the Enrich guidance that's there on the site to encourage the parents to involve themselves with their children's learning? Oh, right, Tom. That, that reminds me about a project I did a couple of years ago uh, because we were asked a similar question. and um, We worked with colleagues at Nesta and we developed an area of Enrich which we call Solving Together. And it's ideal for late primary, early secondary, because we're asking the questions, what does it look for, look like when parents are doing maths at home? Is it supervising? Is it teaching? Is it encouraging? Is it checking? What were we looking for? And what we decided to try and encourage was doing the maths together, enjoying games and puzzles together. We thought that was the best way forward, not trying to put parents on the spot by saying, could you go and teach this way to bisect an angle? but having support there as needed. So what we did with Solving Together is we recorded some short videos, um, two or three minutes with a member of the team modeling, playing an image activity or exploring an image activity. And we also put that up as a Word document. So there's more than one way of doing it. Then we chose an activity, put a whole group of them on the website and put the banner Solving Together with an introduction about what it is we're trying to do. And it was part of a research project and we didn't know how it was going to go. But if you don't try, you don't find out, do you? So we worked with schools who very generously set these activities as homework activities for several weeks. And what happened? Significant increase in parental involvement when the homework was being set by the school and it was homework that was being set to do together and there was support for the parents with the video clips. And when it was most successful, it was then discussed back in the classroom. Um, you know, what was happening? There were issues, okay, because not everybody had the internet at home. If a child was using a homework club at school, how do you go about it that way? So we were quite early there at finding some of the issues that later came about during lockdown, but maybe two years ahead of finding what those problems were and starting to get them flagged up. Um, because it's been a huge project to try and get everybody to have that online access. But I think working with parents, um, modelling activities is really key. So providing videos, just short clips of using activities that you really value, that the parents can choose to watch, um, seems to be a really good way forward. Great, lovely. Thank you very much. Um... I think there's one last question that's come up in, in the Q&A box. It's from Nikat Deshmukh, which is about asking whether more than two students could join simultaneously within an activity on the Enrich website. Um, how, how do you go about planning for sort of wider group activities, I think is the sort of the, the direction I'd like to steer that one in. Uh, yeah, we love doing these. Um, where we're based at Cambridge, we're in the maths faculty. So we have access to the lecture theatres and they're huge. And we use those activities in the lecture theatres and we put them on the big screen. And we either do it so we play against the computer, which works great because you can have the whole team or the whole class or the whole lecture theatre deciding which one to go for, or play the, team, uh, play the teacher, that works well, or dividing the room in two and getting them to work collaboratively and choosing what goes in. So although it might say one player, Perhaps it ought better say one team and maybe play it that way. But I've loved doing that. It's one of the real, it's the high, one of the highlights of being a rich director is going into the lecture theatre, finding hundreds of school students in there when we're allowed to do that, or trying an activity, thinking mathematically and almost urging the presenter, come on, choose mine, choose mine. I know what it is, choose mine. And I guess when we were doing Got It, some of you are thinking the same way about choosing the number. Please go for my number. I know it's the one you should choose. That's when we've got them thinking mathematically and hopefully becoming young mathematicians. That was fantastic. Thank you so, so much.
that's that's all we have time for today and um, I hope that you really enjoyed the webinar and thank you for your questions and uh, apologies if we didn't get to your question but I hope that the discussion was was really interesting and thank you very much Ems for your time being with us today and and for for hosting this, for presenting this session it's yeah it's been really really fantastic um, as we said earlier, we're going to be uploading a recording uh, of the session to YouTube, so um, you'll be able to revisit the webinar and uh, share this with your colleagues. And it just leaves me to uh, say thanks once again to EMS and to wish you all uh, an enjoyable rest of your day. And thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>